What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Story Man Podcast, episode 11. I am Clay Morgan, as always, here with J.R. Foresteros and Matt Michalatos. What is up, men? Nothing, man. Having a great day. It is finally warm in Ohio. Yes, it is like 80 degrees in Pittsburgh. Woo! Matt, is it raining in Portland? <laughs> um, I haven't been outside yet. Uh, <laughs> you I haven't grumpy hobbit. Again, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's like what? It's like three o'clock in the morning there, right? Yeah, you guys always want to film so early here. Oh man! Well, you know, some of us are trying to launch our promising podcast career in between <laughs> day class and night class. So <laughs> you're stuck, West Coast. Oh, that's fine. I'm thinking about moving out your guys' way just to make the schedule a little less brutal. <laughs> Well, tis the season of springtime. Um, actually, I was reading a book recently called Confederates in the Attic. Did you guys realize that this week marks the anniversary of the start and end of the Civil War? What? I did not realize that. I did not. They ended this week. They start. It started and ended this week. Yeah. So in um, April, on April twelfth, eighteen sixty one, was the official beginning of the Civil War, and on April ninth. 1865, Lee, Robert E. Lee surrendered to the North at Appomattox Courthouse. Why didn't they just why? wait three days? Yeah, why? <laughs> Let's have some symmetry here, South. Something about the uh, soldiers of the Confederacy um, didn't have any more food or hope. I don't blah, know. Blah, blah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, oh, man. We should call this podcast Three Yankees. <laughs> yeah, right? The South will rise again. <laughs> well, after reading Confederates in the Attic, I have a really different perspective of the South. It was really a good book. But here's something else that's interesting. So I'm the history guy, right? It's my job yep. to pull together these, these dates. One century to the day after the outbreak of the Civil War, Neil Armstrong, April 12, 1961, landed... Or, I'm sorry, my bad. Um, Yuri Gagarin, April 12, 1961, became the first man in space. Cool. Which was That's the. Awesome. That was huge. He was the famous cosmonaut who really people didn't think he was going to live. You know, nobody knew if it was even possible. He was a real hero in, in space travel. And then also in 1970, on April 11th, the Apollo 13 mission launched, which was made famous by the Tom Hanks mm -hmm. movie. Um, Wasn't it and, first made famous because it almost didn't make it back? <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, so Jim Lovell and his crew made it famous by actually doing it. <laughs> my Gen X mind just remembers the movie version. <laughs> I just remember in the movie when the guys on the Apollo 13 kept saying, do you think they're going to make a movie about this? Like over and over. <laughs> oh, they did. Super meta. <laughs> Yeah, for me it was cool when I was when I was younger seeing that in the theater because uh, I did you know I really didn't know what happened so it was like really suspenseful. I didn't realize everybody yeah. already knew how it ended. Hey, I feel like <laughs> jumping over a hundred years there. Come on, Professor Morgan, give us something more in the middle. You got uh, something. Well, there have been quite a few. You know, I'm kind of a I'm kind of a date wonk. Um, so I found one that I thought might be interesting. Ladies. What's what, that? I know. What kind of date is that? I said, ladies. <laughs> I have a friend who is a date one. Okay, okay, okay. Here you go. When I was a kid, I had to read a book that probably many people have had to read in their education called The Gift of the Magi. Oh, yeah. And it was I published, Henry. It was published yes. in 1906 on April 10th. Nice. I didn't realize it was that old. What? Uh, was it like in the newspaper or something, or was it, where, where was it? Do we know where it was published? Oh, he he published a collection of um, short stories, and it was one of them. Oh, okay. I just always thought that I was the greatest that story. story. I was actually in a stage version of Gift of the Magi when I was in college, but it was at a community theater, not at my college. Really? Did yes, I was. I was the guy who shaved off his beard to buy something for his girl. <laughs> uh, no, actually, I. Did not. No, I did have a beard then. I played the husband, and I had to sell my, my pocket watch to buy her combs for her hair. Which, okay, so in that story, spoiler alert, um, it's a couple <laughs> that's in love, and they uh, want to get each other Christmas presents, but they're poor. And so she has this long, beautiful hair, and he has this pocket watch that's been in his family forever. And so he pawns his pocket watch to buy these combs for her hair, and she cuts her hair off and sells it, because this was before Locks of Love. 
uh, and then buys him a chain for his pocket watch. Even to this day, I think, well, wait a second, she can just grow her hair back. Like, in six months, she yeah. can use those combs. But then no, his but watch is gone use... forever. No, he could use the chain for the brush, though. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. It's totally fair. Oh, Henry Bling. <laughs> so, so yeah, I was actually, I was actually the the guy, and then I, uh, um, I was the the way the play was written focused more on uh, the wife, but I was the husband, and so I had some scenes at the beginning and at the end, and I had to really dig deep to uh, to really find my. Uh, you know my motivation. But. So, oh, so wow. how how did it go? Were you? Um, I mean, that's like a love story, right? Did you have to like? Well, we, yeah. We, so it was funny because I was a 19 year old kid, and I was like sophomore in college, and my co star, the star, I was her, I was the co star. The star was 24, and she was quite lovely, and Ooh, so wow. 20. Yeah, nineteen-year-old me thought he was uh, pretty tough stuff because he was uh, in this and all these scenes with this with this woman. Uh, and I remember, so we had to, you know, when I go to work in the morning, I'm supposed to kiss her goodbye. And so we uh, we did the kiss, and then our director, like in the in practice, you know, rehearsal, and and the director apparently thought it was like the least passionate kiss ever. And so <laughs> she made us stand there in front of the whole cast and just keep kissing over and over and over again until we got it right. So, so yeah. I kept messing it up. Yeah, I, I kept messing it up for a long time. Yeah, but you were um, getting more action than me at nineteen. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was really sad, so I, you know, I, I thought that I thought that we were, uh, I thought that we really had something, and so I invited her. I invited her to one of my. I didn't understand acting at the time, uh, so I, I invited her to one of my band's concerts because you know that's how you get chicks, and uh, she showed up with one of her guy, one of her guy friends, and so I, I took the hint. Oh, that oh that man. Yeah. What, were there, were there okay. other people there, or was it just you as a third wheel? Oh no, it was I, it was my band's concert, so like there were uh, okay. it was a venue, it was like packed. And was, <laughs> I was in a metal band, so I was I was able to use the anger and the hurt, you know, in the show <laughs> that night. But did you um, give her the Dumb and Dumber speech? Yeah, right. So you're, you're telling me there's a chance. chance. <laughs> did you did you kiss her goodbye? It's maybe no, no. It was unfortunate. I didn't. I tried, and she said, the play's over, man. <laughs> so I can't read Gift of the Magi today without bringing up some really bad feelings. Well, I'm glad I suggested it. Um, I just thought yeah, it was a really good story. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, did you ever do any theater? Oh, yeah, man. I was way into theater in high school. In fact, that's how I got started writing. Um, I, I didn't realize that I was writing. I was making, you know, I was doing plays and things, and I thought of it as acting. And it was only later uh, in college when I started getting serious about my writing that I looked back and said, actually, I was writing in high school. I just didn't think of it that way. Interesting. So, yeah. What and that's of, why what today when I'm writing, I speak out loud. What's the, really? Oh, my favorite. Oh, yeah. A lot of times I do. Huh. The characters will talk to each other. I do voices. Beautiful. <laughs> I'd like to watch your process. <laughs> no kidding, right? We need to get I'll that on video. It. I'll, I'll turn on my camera sometime when I'm writing. <laughs> um, yeah, I often read aloud what I'm working on. Uh, yeah, you know, I really enjoyed doing Shakespeare a lot. Uh, we did Taming of the Shrew, and uh, it was just a blast. It was really fun. And I always enjoyed musicals, actually, too, because I, I sing a bit as well. So, good times. Here's a callback to the Civil War era. Do you know who the most famous Shakespearean actor of the 19th century was? John Wilkes Booth. Robert, Robert E. Lee. You are close, Michelados. <laughs> it is Edwin Booth. Abraham Lincoln? Oh. John's, <laughs> John's brother. Oh, man. Yeah. Huh. That's sad. Yeah, he went yeah, on. No, and, no um, one remembers him. Edwin Booth went on oh. and had a very distinguished career. There's a statue of him in New York at, uh, I think, Gramercy Park uh, in his full Hamlet monologuing. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did he ever perform at Ford's Theater? That's a good question. I, I imagine he had performed before that. Um, Ford's Theater ended up being converted into uh, like federal office buildings for a time um, until the floor collapsed and like 20 people were killed or something. What? It was only later on that it was converted back into a theater, I think. I, I'm pretty sure I have this right. Um, that place and, they really uh, brought the right. house down, huh? Yo. Oh, oh. Too soon. <laughs> too, too soon. 
so hey, we're going to talk today about uh, something that I'm very excited about because uh, both Matt and Clay are published authors, and I am not, but I would sure like to be. <laughs> and so, uh, we and so they were. We were talking the other day and kind of figuring out what we want to do for shows. And both of them mentioned that they get requests all the time because they're published from people who are wanting to know how they get published. And they were gracious not to look at me when they said that. Uh, so we thought, well, hey, what if we just did a show about how do you get published? And so, could you talk? Um, tell us both. You guys are both published. Could you tell us a little bit about like what you've written and what you're working on? right now and how like how long you've been uh, published I guess and publishing Matt you said you've been writing since high school when did you when did you really start taking seriously to try to get published oh yeah so in high school yeah I was writing uh, college I did you know um, I did the school newspaper and then I became a writing major actually uh, eventually which was cool <laughs> no Still future wasn't... <laughs> 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 No, that's funny. My parents did at one point say I needed a backup major so that I could make money after I graduated, <laughs> and I told them that my backup would be theater, and then uh, <laughs> then they told me I could do whatever I wanted, which they're very supportive, actually, which was nice. Um, yeah, but uh, let's see. I had been graduated from college for several years before, let's see, one, two, three Gosh, it may have been five years after college before I had my first professionally published magazine article, something like that, four or five, uh, largely because I didn't believe in rewriting. Uh, I do pretty solid first drafts, and I thought, well, maybe somebody will want this. And then one day I did two or three drafts of something, and it immediately sold. I was like, oh, huh. That was like the first day of advice in my creative writing program, rewrite. Now, let me interrupt, Matt. How did, how did yeah, you... Um... How, were you were doing freelance at the time? Did, was this a local publication? Were you sending things off? You know what's funny? My very first published article was with uh, a now defunct Christian satire magazine called The Wittenberg Door. Okay. And, uh, huh. The story was called um, Estrogen Dampens the Holy Spirit. <laughs> And it was all about uh, scientific work that was showing that the reason that men should be in charge of everything is that estrogen causes the Holy Spirit not to be as effective in someone's life. It's a pretty funny article. I can, I can, uh, we can link to it, actually. I've got it on Google Docs somewhere. For sure. But uh, what I discovered was whenever I was angry about something uh, in ministry or something like that, I could write a funny article about it. I felt better. The Wittenberg Door would publish <laughs> it and send me 75 bucks. So I was like, this is perfect. Hey, what else could I be angry about? <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, oh, yeah. you worked in the church world, so hardly Actually, anything. Yeah, no, but I did stuff. Jr., you probably like the. Uh, I did a. Uh, I did an interview with Superman for the Wittenberg Door, talking about his appearance in the last Superman movie and how it like connected <laughs> with God. Wait, 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 wait. What do you, when you say last Superman movie, do you mean Superman Returns or the last Christopher Reeve Superman movie? Superman Returns. You're right. We shouldn't count it, but it was there. <laughs> uh, it was no worse than three or four. No, shut yeah, up. Yeah, but it didn't have Richard Pryor. <laughs> True. Uh, what about, is Superman 4 the quest for peace, or is that Superman yep. 5? I uh, think that's only 4. I think 4 is quest for peace. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, when he throws all the nuclear warheads into the sun. Um, there yes. might have been some structural issues there, including the fight on the moon in an elevator. But uh, <laughs> I still liked it better than Superman Returns. Um, yeah, so anyway, yeah, I started writing short fiction, and then I started writing, or, well, you know, satire stuff, and then I wrote for Discipleship Journal, a couple other places, and then, yeah, I actually talked to some people at a publisher and said, hey, I'm, I'm kicking around a book idea, and they said, yeah, we want to see it, and uh, not to go into too much detail, but I ended up hanging out with Gary Thomas, uh, I don't know if you know him, he's an author, he wrote um, Sacred Marriage, uh, in a variety okay, of yeah. books like that. Mm -hmm. So Gary taught a class that I was in. So I hung out with him, and I was saying, you know, I don't think I'm going to get an agent. These people seem interested. And he was like, I hate to tell you not to get published with someone, but you really should get an agent. And so, I mean, yeah, he gave me three names and said, you can use my name with these three people. And uh, I wrote those three agents. They all, actually, one of them uh, was your agency, Clay. Um, so that was 
that was uh, looked at going with McGregor yeah. for a while there. But yeah, uh, so those three got back to me. They all wanted to see more, and yeah, I ended up eventually the guy Wes Yoder, who I'm with now, is spectacular. I love him. Mm -hmm. But he looked at my initial proposal, liked the proposal, didn't like my writing. He's like, "Why are you doing this?" Uh, do you even like this kind of book? And I was like, no, but I thought it would get published. And he said, why don't you write what you love? And I said, well, it's going to be really weird. <laughs> he said, yeah, but try it. And we actually talked for a long time about it. He said, write a narrative. And I said, you mean like Dante's Inferno or something? And he was like, he had just finished reading it on vacation or something, which shows you that he's a genius. But he was like, yeah, something <laughs> like that. So that's how Imaginary Jesus got started, actually. Wow. Um, and that's why actually the Apostle Peter ends up being your guide through the book is purely because at that point I was thinking of the Inferno. I was like, well, I'll be the main <laughs> character. I need someone to walk me through this. Yeah. The Apostle Peter. Uh, so actually there's a lot of weird similarities uh, where I'm ripping off Dante throughout the book. Yeah, I never thought about it. I'm going to have to go back and we're going to do an imaginary Jesus show down the line. I'm going to have to reread it with that mindset. Yeah, so we Clay, can try to get Dante on the you? show also. Yeah, Dante, sure. <laughs> <laughs> What's so, your, yeah, Clay, what uh, about you? How did you get published? So my, my, um, my journey was weird. The first thing that happened was I got an incredible teacher in college who just started to pull out of me that I love to write. And uh, one of my mentors died suddenly in my third oh, wow. year. And I went home that day. I was so upset. And I had always kind of known that writing was an outlet for me. So I wrote this piece about him. And I must have got it in the school, the college paper. Um, and one of the people in the department came to me and said, this is really phenomenal. Do you, do you mind if we submit it to this academic journal? It was for this like Pennsylvania State Educators or something. And I said, yeah, sure, whatever. There was no money or anything, but I still have a, a copy of that. Um, never even occurred to me that I had be, been published in some capacity, you know? Uh -huh. Um, so I just kind of went on my way. I continued to bounce around doing a number of things. And I'm, I'm trying to think of what bridged the gap. Oh, I know what it was. I had a resume writing business. And there was a publication in town. It was one of these free papers you find at the grocery store or like, you know, in common areas where they're just free on the rack. You could take them. Yeah. And I would read it every time. And I wanted to get advertising for my resume business in the paper. So I contacted the name listed as the editor of this publication. And I said to her, um, can I ask you who edits your paper that comes out every week for free, every other week? And she said, well, we don't have anybody who does that. I just basically collect the articles and put them in, in there. And I said, well, no offense, but it, you can tell. <laughs> and I, I said, how about you let me edit your paper, and in exchange, you give me advertising and a booth at your job fairs. So I actually kind of broke into, that was Infinity Broadcasting, a pretty big um, radio company nationwide. Nice. And uh, next thing you know, she gets promoted, and they come to me and offered me a contract to take over this publication for six months. So nice. that was really good experience because I learned to work under deadline. And not only did I have, that's where Education was born, which was my former website title. Oh, yeah. So not only did I have to come up with a biweekly column or bimonthly or whatever, I don't know if there's a difference, but any time there was a space in the magazine, we had to fill it. And the thing was, you didn't know how many spaces there would be until two hours before deadline, before print. Oh, so I had oh. to learn how to write fast filler <clears throat> pieces in like sometimes as quick as 20, 30 minutes. Um, and I started creating a file. I would have been a great blogger back then had I known. Yeah, wow. Um, but anyway, that's kind of a break I got. And then teaching happened, and I quit writing essentially until um, until I decided to start blogging in 2009. And like literally the week I started blogging, I called the, the Post Gazette, the Pittsburgh Post Gazette in town because I'd been working on this piece about Harry Houdini. Um, yeah. And they they loved the idea. I just call, I just cold contacted a phone number I found on the internet, and somebody looked at the piece, and then this editor called me back, and they ran this two thousand word full page feature in the Sunday paper. Um, and if oh. you're curious as to what newspapers pay for freelance, um, I mean my contract at Infinity ends. was different. I got for a two thousand word Sunday feature 
um, one hundred and twenty five dollars. Wow! Which it's a check, but you're right. definitely working for the credit, and and it certainly did help when it came time for me to to um, go to the writers conference and um, being in a big city newspaper was a nice clip to have. So, how did that lead to you getting your book deal? <laughs> Well, I just would say that um, when it came time for me to go to my first conference and to start talking to agents, um, I kind of had this experience as a writer. You know, I was, I had been paid to write in a couple different places. I had a lot of content, some good clips that I was able to take with me and kind of show to them on the spot, um, which that's the most direct correlation for me. And so you met your agent at a uh, writer's conference, is that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I went to it was at Wheaton. There's not too many big writers conferences for nonfiction stuff that I was looking to do. Yeah. Um, actually, I went to a small conference in Philadelphia. It was a two day conference just to learn how these things even worked. And I had no intention. I didn't even have a book. I just went to a conference in <laughs> Philadelphia. I pitched an agent for the first time just so I could get through the experience of sweaty palms sitting across from a guy who <laughs> wanted to get to lunch after 73 consecutive pitches. Oh God. He was not getting it at all, but that was fine. I learned the process, and I learned what to expect of a conference. So when I put down big money to go spend five days in Chicago at a real conference, I was really prepared. And the funny oh, thing was I had targeted three particular agents who I was hoping would take a look at my stuff, and and they were interested. But the the most amazing agent who I didn't know she was there – um, I, I got to sit at dinner with the organizer of the conference. She heard my book idea, and she found this agent and told her about me. And like the next day, this agent actually came and found me. Um, and that was Amanda Liedeke, and she's just awesome. So we hit it off. And it, you, Matt, you know this. I mean, the, the relationship is so huge. Yeah. Um, the author-agent relationship. Yeah. And any, any author-editor, author-agent. And I'm much... I'm much greener at this than Matt. I'm only in my first book and, and just learning this world for a couple of years, but um, she's been phenomenal. Now, let's. I want to stop there for a second because I think this is something that I've learned just from you guys, but there are, there are different fields and sort of almost levels that you have to work through to get to the publishing house. So, so right now we're talking strictly about tradition, the traditional publishing route, which is right. you go to a publishing house and they put out your, your book. So you can't, well, you can, but you should not, uh, just mail your manuscript to an editor or a publishing house, right? Uh, that, that's certainly, it, it almost changes according to the publishing house. Some, some of, particularly the smaller houses, are glad to have people send them things, and they'll they'll say that publicly. Uh, but the larger the larger the publishing house, the less likely that you have a direct line to an editor, uh, an acquisitions editor, which is someone who buys books. The gatekeeper. Uh, yeah. Now there can be like uh, the science fiction publisher Tor uh, has a slush pile you can get into. But what that means is interns are reading through, looking for something that's not garbage that they'll pass along when they're not busy fetching coffee or whatever else interns do. So it's like, it's your Hail Mary pass to try and get published at a major house. And you're much better off finding an agent to represent you because then you go to top of the pile. Not the slush pile. So let's talk about, let's pile. talk about, let's talk about what, tell, what is a literary agent? What do they do? How do I get connected with one? Yeah. Um, so, well, probably Clay and I should make it clear that neither of us have much experience as uh, uh, in the non or the newer ways of being published the self-publishing realm uh, I mean Clay have you done much of that I've done basically none no and I'm I'm looking to do that next year but it's a good point because the first question I ask someone when they say how do I get published is what are your goals right if your yeah. goal is to just get some work that you can have on your person or in your office or at your church, there's a lot of ways you can just have a nice looking product there to distribute or even sell it if you want to, you know. Um, right. Is so so self publishing. I think that is another topic entirely. Amazon is cre is really changing everything. Um, but yeah, we're we're talking about kind of the more traditional route. Right, and I mean, 
and both ways are valid. They're good things. And I think, like Clay said, it's what do you want to do? Like, I saw Paul Young this last weekend at a writer's the conference. Shack. Yeah, the guy who wrote The Shack. And, you know, Paul, uh, Paul wrote The Shack for his kids. He printed 15 copies at Kinko's. <laughs> and he said this last weekend, he goes, the moment I printed those 15 copies and handed them to my kids and friends, the book had accomplished everything I desired for it to do. That's what he wanted. And, of course, within a year, it had sold a million copies, yeah. which, uh, yeah, good job. I mean, that's amazing. I mean, he would put that <laughs> all on, uh, he would put that all on, on that's what the Lord chose to do, for sure. But, uh, yeah, so let's talk about what traditional publishing, um, which is where the author should not be putting any money in. The publisher puts money in. Uh, so design, editing, marketing, all of that, well, maybe not, maybe not on marketing, but almost all of that comes from the publisher. Why not on marketing? Sense. Well, some oh, people you mean do, all of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some people okay. hire somebody to help them with yeah, marketing. Yeah. Um, but uh, plus, you yes, do your own self-marketing, right, on your blog through your social well, media. Well, yeah, right, exactly. But yeah. you, as far as putting money in, it should all be optional. You shouldn't get a bill from your publisher. Right, right. And, I was and, planning uh, to hire M Night Shyamalan to make a book trailer for me. <laughs> Oh, great. Yeah, you can do that. It's going to have a, a cool twist at the end. <laughs> yeah, it's going to. Yeah, at the end it'll say, surprise, it's not for a movie, it's for JR. <laughs> See, I think it'll um, be a big hit. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I think Clay and I, we both love our agents, and uh, so we're big proponents of going with an agent and trying things that way. So, basically, uh, there are three things an agent or a publisher is looking for when they see you when you're having that sweaty palm meeting uh, at the writer's conference or you send them something in the email or the traditional mail, whatever way you do it, however you approach them, they're looking for three things. One is, do you have the skills? Are you a writer? Are, do you have the potential to be professional or are you professional already? And we'll, we'll break these down. And the second is, do you have something worth writing about? Do you have a compelling topic, basically? And then third, what's your platform? So platform being your reach uh, outside of yourself. So do you have a giant blog? Do you have a bazillion Twitter followers? Do you have three Twitter followers? Are you, uh, whatever, do you speak at some professional association that's going to want your kind of book? So those are kind of the three basic categories they're looking for. And typically, I talked to an agent this weekend who told me, if you have two out of the three, they're going to look at you pretty closely. If you have one out of the three, it better be a really spectacular one. Um, and if you have all three, they, uh, he was telling me, like, he's about to sit down and have a meeting with a bunch of people doing the 15-minute meetings. He was like, gosh, if I could find one that had the three, all three things, I would snatch them up in a moment. So let's just walk through it for a second. Like, so the first one is uh, showing that you're professional, that you have ability and skill to write. So, uh, yeah, what's... So, Clay, your story had several aspects of that. Like, so what would be some of those things for you that you think would have shown Amanda that you're a professional starting out? I think um, a knockout idea that got a couple of people really excited. Um, and then the clips. I had some good writing experience. Like I said, a lot of people can write, but because, you know, I'd been published by a couple people, places in a newspaper that helped yeah. it might you you carry clips like if you're going to go meet an agent or if you're going to go to a conference I carried a folder with my best clips right yeah. um, and it was nice that they weren't just printed on a word document but they were actually reproductions from a, a high profile publication so that kind of validated the fact that I could write and and okay. again you know I'm How sure you'll you? talk about this Matt good writing there's a lot of good writing that gets passed up by a lot of smart agents. It's it's yeah. really about fit. Yeah. You know, you could have a really killer book, and there's going to be 20 people who just aren't interested in that particular thing. Like Matt, you had to find somebody who was down with the weird, and <laughs> and, and, yeah. and got what you were trying to do, right? Well, and one of the things I loved about Wes actually is that he pushed me to do something different than I was doing. He said, "This doesn't seem like a good fit for you." I his, actually, almost word for word for what he said was, you seem like a deeply weird person, and that's not what I'm seeing in your writing sample. He wanted me to be myself. Um, 
But Clay, how many how many articles like do you know like ballpark how many you had written for the newspaper at that point? Well, yeah, I mean, I could tell you for freelance, I had done the one. I'm not sure if I had done my second one. I've had two in the Post Gazette. I mean, I had dozens of pieces, but they were kind of all with the same publication, right? Right, um, but they still showed you were professional. You could meet a deadline. Yeah. You have writing. Yeah, you can churn out content. Yeah. <laughs> because of my resume writing business, I had written, uh, you know, all these free publications. This, there's a there's a great place to go. Go into your grocery store and look for every free publication in your community. I found one called the Employment Guide. I mean, it's a pretty well known oh, publication. Yeah. So I actually put two or three articles in the employment guide, didn't get paid, um, but I got the clips and it led to a gig in this publication called Today's Nurse that, <laughs> that, appeared, that appeared in three cities. I still have the clips somewhere. So basically That's an awesome. article I wrote appeared in Columbus, St. Louis, and Pittsburgh in Today's Nurse. That's Again, cool. I didn't make any money, but the clips looked really good. Like I showed this diversity of, look, I've been published in a few different places. Right, and I had maybe three magazines. Most of mine were with the Wittenberg Door. I had Discipleship Journal, and then some one-off, uh, you know, I think I had a short story or two that had been published in some little, like, literary zines kind of thing. So we're talking maybe 12 total things that would have been in my folder that you were referring to, Clay, that just said, yeah, Matt's a professional. He's not going to leave you hanging if you give him a deadline. He knows what he's doing. Uh, yeah, writing samples, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, so that's the first thing. You want to prove that you can write, that you have the ability and the skill to do it. So, and then, uh, so you have something compelling to write about would be the second thing. So, Clay, you said that Amanda came looking for you when she heard what your topic was. Tell us about Undead and what was it that was compelling and different than what else was out there? Well, I mean, essentially, so um, the the title was different initially, right? It was a killer title. Talk about it. Tell us what it was. Can you okay, so nobody nobody's ever allowed to steal this from me. This is my title on record. Copyrighted on the story, man, right here. You heard <laughs> it first. And, 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 and we are seeking... <laughs> we believe that this title is good enough that we're going to do something with it. But the original title was Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Zombies. Nice. And it was um, essentially a similar concept to what Undead was. It was basically the same thing. It, you know, if, I, if we would have kept that title, Undead would have still looked the same. But um, it was that idea of how to capitalize on the whole zombie popularity and um, I just had the idea that there were a whole bunch of dead people who had come back to life in the Bible and how could we play up that pop culture humor side of it? Um, and because I had, I literally had at the dinner, it, conferences are cool because you get meals, you get three meals, and it's a great time to sit with publishers, editors. Um, I mean, if you want to spend 30 minutes with somebody at a conference and you put the money there, you're going to get the opportunity. And I, on the first night, just happened to bump into one of the women who organized the whole conference because I listened to a talk of hers on CD once. And I just said, hey, thanks for that talk. It really helped me. And she invited me to sit with her, and I started telling her my idea. And the next thing you know, um, she had that conversation on my behalf. It was, it was really uh, incredible. Her name's Jane Rubietta. So that was where the idea came in, in my case. That's great. Yeah, and I think it was really similar with me, like my basic idea. Imaginary Jesus, by the way, started out as a nonfiction book. Uh, where it was more like um, it was it was a comedy, but it was more like imagine like my pitch was essentially imagine if Don Miller was funnier. Uh, <laughs> it, it's accessible theology, but it's really funny, and you're going to want to pass it around to your friends. Kind That's of good. Um, but uh, yeah, like I said, Wes pushed me. He's like, "You clearly love fiction. Why don't you do fiction?" Um, which had not been my plan. But the idea was, uh, the basic idea, theology should be fun. Let's talk about our misconceptions about Jesus. And to back it up, I had, you know, I've been on staff with Campus Crusade for years, interacted a lot with college students. You kind of put that all together. And the idea was compelling enough that every agent I pitched it to said, yeah, I want to I see more about that. Because they saw those two things, right? You're a professional. You've got an interesting idea. So those yeah. two things by themselves really should have been enough for Clay and I and anybody 
to at least get a conversation, get your foot in the door. Um, and then the third thing, and the thing that I think most people that I talk to who aren't published that are just like freaked out about is mm -hmm. platform. Uh, just so nervous about it. And so let's talk a little bit about that. Platform, okay, again, being your reach, which basically the question is how is the author going to be able to help sell this book? So, Clay, what did your platform look like when you and Amanda uh, started your, uh, your deal together? That doesn't sound right, but you know what I mean. Well, for my blog, Education, was it had a great community. It consistently had a lot of comments, and, and that helped. The actual numbers weren't massive, although I did hit um, a big number right around that time because um, – I wrote a story about the Joplin earthquake and uh, Will Norton, a young guy who was killed, and his family, as they were becoming internationally known, his family took my post and really exposed it to many, many people. Mm. Um, but I kind of wonder, like honestly, I am not, clearly I'm not Michael Hyatt. I've since rebranded, so I'm kind of started over in a lot of ways with blogging, um, but you know, I didn't have huge numbers. Some agents will tell you that you need to have like 20,000 unique visitors a month. But who's really there? You know, who's really at that level? For me, I was kind of like, I had a nice all around social media blogging package. I was savvy with Facebook and Twitter. You know, I kept up with the ways to communicate with people. I, I worked at my blog and was consistent with it. And um, all that together looked good enough to to show people again that I can get there I can I can I can hold together a platform so uh, we should point out there's a huge difference in publishers right like people who yeah. are thinking they're gonna get published um, and they're gonna just like call up Zondervan or Random House and get a deal um, there's a ton of different houses and success for one house might be that you have to sell a hundred thousand copies Meanwhile, yeah. success for another house might be sell four thousand copies, and you've and you've hit the target for this place. And so, based on those expectations and those size of those publishers, platform means something different to them too, wouldn't you think? Oh yeah, absolutely. I was nowhere near twenty thousand visitors a month when I sold Imaginary Jesus, or when I got Wes as my agent. I don't recall exactly, but I'd be surprised if it was much higher than five thousand a month or something at that time on my blog. Um, you talking about not, visitors? Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't think it was much higher than that. Um, it, now I understand. There's a lot of people out there that are like, I've got five people coming to my blog right. a month, uh, and that's okay. And I think the thing is, don't get stressed out about it mm -hmm. because there are other things that are part of your platform. And it could be, do you? Are you a pastor and you speak every week to the same 300 people, the same 500 people, whatever? Are you part of a, a association of different people? Uh, are, yeah, if, if you're a professional, let's say you're writing a book about dentistry or something, and you're a dentist, and you talk every year to a group of a thousand dentists, that's part of your platform. Um, so yeah, it can be, like for me, being part of Campus Crusade for Christ and saying, here's this really influential group of missionaries that I have access to, that's part of my platform. Um, so any of those things can be part of platform. And while we do have, so you can have a blogger who is not a good writer and is not a professional writer, but has a million hits a month, let's say, they can get a book deal because their platform's gigantic. But you see, they didn't have all three things an agent's looking for. They just are able to answer that question, do I think I can sell this? Hmm. So if you are focused because on what you can... Yeah, go ahead. That's yeah. the that's what I think is really important to remember is it doesn't matter if God told you to write something. It doesn't matter if you've wanted to write this book since you were a little kid. Like the publishing houses don't care about any of that. What they care about is can you make them money? That's exactly right. That's and exactly so, right. It's a business and that's a that's a shocking statement sometimes, especially at a Christian conference where you know, we talked about this JR with Dallas Jenkins a little bit. But, but you don't understand, God told me to write this. It has to be successful because I'm obeying his will. And and the reality is um, it is a business, and God doesn't ask people with money to throw it down the drain. Right. Exactly. They're, yeah, they're making an investment. And I think people probably don't understand that at these major houses particularly, 
when they're making an investment to make your book, we're talking about tens of thousands of dollars plus overhead, plus salaries for editors and things like that. So it's not like a small decision to choose to print your book, to publish it. It's a big deal, and they want to make sure that they're not being unwise in that and losing what God has called them to do, which is, you know, make, make books. I should point out, Matt, when you were talking, I was thinking about this because we keep talking about platform, right? Like I was a, I was a college teacher. Some people like to call me a professor even though – Technically, I'm, a, I'm an adjunct instructor. Maybe that helped me with my platform, right? Yeah, for sure. But um, fiction is different, isn't it? And, and yes, yeah. if you have a big platform, you can write about pretty much whatever you want. But as far as a, a debut writer goes, um, I think fiction works differently. It's, it's more yeah. about the writing the completed manuscript, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. So in nonfiction... You need, to, uh, you need to bring to them a proposal of what you're going to write, show them why you're an expert, talk about who's going to want to buy it. With fiction, you have to write the whole book because they want to make sure you can finish it and that like, you're not writing an Amish romance that ends with aliens in the last chapter. Like, they want to know what's going to happen in this thing. So let's say you I would write, read that book. I know you would. <laughs> you should write it, JR. <laughs> um, the, uh, so let's say you write like an awesome thriller about uh, whatever, it doesn't matter. You write an incredible thriller, and you have zero platform. You've been living in your mom's basement writing this thriller for the last three years. But it's an incredible book that, like, your agent can't stop reading it. And, you know, they're going to see dollar signs. They're going to go, Hollywood's going to buy this. It's going to sell not because you're going to tell anyone, but because everyone's going to tell each other. The Shack? That's fine. Yeah, sure, that's basically what happened with The Shack. Of course, no one wanted to buy it. I mean, it was still self-published when it hit a million copies. That's crazy. Um, I know, is that nuts? By the way, and, if you listen to the audio version, um, I don't know if it's the all the audio versions or the newest one, if you're interested in his story, he comes on and really kind of describes how that whole journey happened with that book. Yeah. Yeah, so let me just say one more thing, and then, JR, let's see if you have any questions for us. So one more thing is this. I hear unpublished authors all the time talking as if agents and publishers have something against them. Like, they don't want them to succeed. They're trying to stop them from succeeding. You guys, agents don't get paid unless you sell your book. And <laughs> publishers don't make any money unless lots of people buy your book. So they are desperately looking through the slush and going to these writing conferences and opening their email every morning, hoping that you will send them something wonderful. They want it to be good. Now, they're jaded because it doesn't happen every day. Uh, <laughs> like so every other day, right? I was about to say, they're rooting for you. Their livelihood ceases to exist if they don't find new authors. So if you're doing well, if you're doing your job, they're going to do theirs. And you can find someone that's going to want to take you on and help you become a published author. And would you say that's true, Cliff? Yeah, and the reality is, I don't know what the numbers are, but it's up around 92% of books that come out every year don't earn out their money. They don't make their yeah. money back. So the publishers are making all their money on a very few select titles. And agents and editors and publishers, they're all in the game to find the, the Stephen King, the Michael Hyatt, the breakout you know, unknown author. It just takes one from their perspective, and everything else they're frankly hoping to break even on. So all that to say, Jr., you should be writing and submitting your stuff right now. Why are you Why are you waiting around so much? Why am I talking to you guys? Right <laughs> I'd be writing. Uh, so so let's. I, I want to be. I want to make sure that we have some really really clear next steps for for me and for anyone who's listening. So um, you know, since 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 you guys are writing primarily not, you're both working on nonfiction books right now. What's the what What are the the Tell me, tell me what a book proposal looks like that I need to have in my hand to go to an agent. Uh, what a, you, so you want to know what a book proposal looks like? Yeah, just walk me down. What are the key ingredients? Yeah, so basically your book proposal is going to have a few things. It is going to tell us about your... We'll, we'll uh, tell you what, we'll post my original book proposal for Imaginary Jesus with this podcast so you can look at it. On the story now, uh, storyman.us. Yep, and that was originally for nonfiction. So it's going to have things like, what is the idea of this book? Who's going to buy this book? 
What books would this book be in uh, competition with? What's your platform? And an outline of the book with a couple of chapters showing what it would look like. I mean, that's some of the basics. A, a little biography about you, stuff like that. Um, so again, you're basically just saying, what's the book? Who are you? Why should we? Why should we buy this book? Right? Yep. And yep. then giving a, them a sample of it. I mean, frankly, it's it's a it's a sales pitch where you're doing two things. One is you're saying, I'm confident this will sell. And two, you're saying is check out my pretty writing. Uh, yeah. And that's basically it. And so I, you know, I would say another another next step, and this might be this might be a little bit defeating for some people, but I think it's really important. If you have not written a lot, what you hear both Clay and Matt talking about is how long and how much they had been writing before they really entered into publishing. If you're not blogging, if you're not journaling, if you're not consistently trying to improve your writing right now, and you're having a hard time getting someone to pay attention to your writing, maybe you need to take some time to become a better writer. You know, maybe you need to start blogging and set blog a couple days a week, uh, a couple, you know, three, four days a week, even if you can. But you know, every writer I've ever talked to says, you know what? Like you've just got to sit down and write every day, even if it's not good, even if it's just total crap cakes. Like you've just got to sit down and just write because that's how you get better. Um, you should be reading good writers, and you should be writing as much as you can, uh, and that's how you get better, and that will give you uh, something more to bring. You can begin to build your platform. There are tons and tons and tons of blogging resources that tell you how to become a better blogger, how to get more readers, and it's not like tricks, tricky things. It's like things, skills that you can use, that you can learn to build your platform. And so if you're looking at those three things, your writing ability, your compelling idea, and your platform, and you say, I've got this really good idea, but I'm not a great writer, or I don't have a big platform, well, those are things that you can fix. Those are things that you can address. And it might take some time, but if your idea is really valuable, it's probably worth putting the time into. Uh, and I, again, I know people don't want to hear that. They want the magic publishing pill that you just take and go. But uh, I mean, you guys are both proof that that's just not how it works. This I've, is a I've, lot of work. I literally had someone ask me, how do I get published? And I walked them through kind of the, the work of it. And they said, well, I was more looking for, like, what can I just do right now without really changing anything I'm doing that will get me published. And Start a like, blog, and then you're self-published. And you don't make any money, but exactly. then you can say you're published. You know, it's interesting thing about writing. Everybody has the ability, the physical ability, to open a Word document and start typing words or to take out a pen and start putting... Um, words down on paper. But we don't walk up to a great piano player after a concert and say, wow, that was amazing. I'm going to do that. You know, or we don't walk up to an yeah. artist and say, you painted incredible. I, I think I'm going to do that now. I've always wanted to paint a picture about my story. And um, writing is such an accessible medium that we often forget about how much of a craft it is, but how much work it is. And And you said it. I mean, that's it is discouraging at times when you're sitting there facing the blank, the blank, blinking eye of writer's death on the on the cursor, and and you've got to just push through when nobody is around. Really, it's an isolated practice. But the good news is, those who finish the work take leaps and leaps ahead. Right? Yeah. I mean, would you yeah. agree? With that? That, I mean, that's what I told my, I, I taught a couple classes this weekend at this writer's conference. One of the things I told them was the, the crappiest book that you find that's published, like the worst, most horrifically bad book that's sitting on the shelf that you go, I could do so much better than this, is better than the book you have in your head because it's done. Someone mm -hmm. wrote it. And uh, if you're just sitting around thinking how great you are and you're not putting it on paper, then it's time to get it on paper. And you probably can beat out some of the books that are out there. Uh, because, yeah. It, anyway, all that to say, if you're passionate about it, if you feel called to it in some sense, and if you're willing to put in the work to learn your craft and to do it well, then, yeah, I think you can be traditionally published. Uh, and, and your readers want that. The agents want that. The publishers want that. So, yeah, go after it. And I have one, I, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable leaving this without saying, if you are going to go the, the conference route, because I kind of learned that world a little bit, I went to three conferences in one year, 
Um, I went to a conference after I had an agent, by the way, because it's never, you can never meet enough editors and experts and other writers. Um, however, don't think that you take your whole manuscript to a conference and when it's time for wow. your agent meeting that you deliver them, you know, f even 50 pages. They've <laughs> traveled, they've packed luggage, they don't want to pay the airlines $25 for an extra bag, so they're not going to take <laughs> your book with you, no matter how promising they think it is. Um, but it is good. It is good to have something to leave in their hands, right? So um, I've always kind of liked the simple idea of a one sheet, just a, a piece of paper, maybe with your name and picture on it, uh, a brief synopsis of what your background is or what your idea is. It can be real simple, um, but at least something to put in their hand, if that even, at least a business card. But sometimes people think they're gonna they're gonna take um, copies of their book or their manuscript to a conference and and hand them off and that's that's just not gonna happen um, yeah I think I did a one sheet a couple years ago I could put an example up if you wanna see what that could look like but yeah. um, it's a marketing tool that's all there's a million ways you can do things just think about the people that you're engaging right um, we're here to serve the industry we're not here to be served by the industry and um, and that's a good mindset if you do feel especially that God has called you he's called us with a servants attitude as well. Alright guys, that, we are out of time this week. Hopefully you got lots of your questions about how to be published answered. Uh, we mentioned a lot of resources during this episode and we are going to put links to all of those on our website. So go to storyman.us and you can see the stuff for building your platform, what a book proposal looks like, what a one sheet looks like, some of the best resources that we know of that are free resources for how to do all of this really well. Uh, we would love to hear what projects you guys have in the works. Uh, we would love for you to ask more questions. Uh, we would be happy to, to do a follow-up episode, maybe even get someone on who's gone the self-publishing route and talk about that as well. Uh, we know that there are a lot of people out there that have stories uh, inside of them waiting to, waiting to be told, and so we would love to hear what those are, and, and we hope that you found all of this really helpful in, in beginning that process. So uh, on behalf of all three of us, I want to say thanks again for listening. As always, we have an awesome special guest on our next episode you won't want to miss. Uh, please don't forget that you can help us out a lot by rating us on iTunes and subscribing to us and things like that, liking us on Facebook. Uh, we really appreciate your guys' support. Uh, we love Storyman, and we're going to keep it going as long as we can. So anything else, guys? Well, it's great. Keep writing. Well said. All right, we'll see you guys in a week. Hooray! Hi, viewers.